With Pyra and Mithra being recently added in Smash, Xenoblade Chronicles 2 is receiving the most attention it's gotten since its launch back in 2017. With all this new online discourse, there is bound to be a whole new audience exposed to this game for the first time. Some people might already be playing the game, and some might be opting out of it because they don't play long RPGs, but there is also bound to be a crowd in the middle who is on the fence about the game. Maybe some people are turned off by the anime-ness of the game. Maybe some people think the gameplay looks boring. Or maybe there are some who tried Xenoblade Definitive Edition and weren't a fan of that game. If you fall into any of those three camps, stick around for a bit and hear me out, because this game is my personal favorite game on the Switch, and I believe it is way better than it might look on the outside. You might hear a lot of people discussing the story, whether people are saying how good or bad it is, but ultimately, I think your enjoyment of Xenoblade 2's story is going to vary from person to person and the types of stories and characters you like. There are a lot of others out there who could cover the story in much more depth than I could, but I'm here to talk about an aspect of the game I don't hear people discuss as much, the gameplay. So grab some popcorn, buckle up, and sit back, because I'm going to explain to you the genius of Xenoblade Chronicles 2's gameplay. I want to start this journey with the original Xenoblade Chronicles. Now, I think this game is incredible. In my opinion, it has one of the best stories told in modern media, it is a masterclass in creative world design and scale, and it was truly groundbreaking for a Wii game in 2012. But some parts of Xenoblade's gameplay feel like they didn't age well. This was made especially apparent when the game was remastered and sold as a new AAA title just last year. Some of the areas can feel a bit empty, and while collecting items to fill out the Collectopedia can be very satisfying, it doesn't do a whole lot aside from offering you up small rewards from time to time. Also, some of the points you need to level things up, like Affinity or AP, can feel a bit grindy and don't always come to you naturally. None of this is necessarily a bad thing, however. I believe that noticing flaws like these are essential for making any kind of sequel. Everything else about the first Xenoblade laid a fantastic foundation for a follow-up. Expansive worlds to explore filled with monsters of varying levels that are fought seamlessly in the world, stringing the player along with a fantastic JRPG narrative. So, was Xenoblade 2 able to fix the flaws of the original? In my opinion, yes. Let's look at how it did that. When I think about the Xenoblade games, I think of the fantastic worlds that the game takes you through throughout its many hours of playtime. While Xenoblade 2 doesn't have the impressive titans of the first game, the smaller titans that you're exploring feel much more lively and dense than the areas in Xenoblade 1 did. And I don't mean that they did this by adding more enemies. There are two things added to the world that makes it more interesting. The first is how collectibles are more bountiful and more valuable. Rather than collecting individual collectibles at each point, each collection point can contain up to 10 or more collectibles. This is just giving you more bang for your buck. How can you say no? Just by looking at a map with the collection point filter, which I don't recommend having on permanently, you'll see just how many collection points there are in any given area, meaning there are a lot of opportunities to get a lot of collectibles. But collectibles are no fun if you don't feel like they accomplish anything. Luckily Xenoblade 2 has way more uses for its collectibles than its predecessor. The game features several different crafting systems. You can use the collectibles to craft many different items that will help you in battle. You will also find that side quests will call for these items as well. Some of them even give you flexibility on what types you will need to complete the quest, making it feel like any collectible you pick up is going to be worthwhile in some way. The other new addition to exploration is the use of field skills. Field skills are semi-unique abilities that your blades have that allow you to perform various action in the world. What are blades, you might be asking? Hink type. I'll talk about them a lot more later. These field skills do things like create an ice bridge to cross to a new piece of land, or bust down a big steel door in your way, or activate a gust of wind that will take you to a higher place. The best part about these field skill checks is that you won't always be able to do them right away. They give you incentive to return to areas you've been to before, so if you're traversing through an old area to complete a side quest, there will almost always be new stuff to do, even if you thoroughly explored the area before. And what makes this even easier, failed field skill checks are marked on your map, so you'll always be able to find them again. Having these extra nooks and crannies hidden in each world makes exploring every little corner of the world feel rewarding, because you never know what you could find there. Gee, this sure sounds like a hassle. Why would I want to go through all this trouble anyways? You might be asking. Well, that is a great question that I can easily answer by introducing these babies, the treasure trolls. 
Now, Xenoblade 1 had lame, basic treasure chests, but the change from treasure chest to treasure trove just automatically makes it a better game. Jokes aside, the trolls themselves aren't what's important here, it's what's inside. No, not that, not that, definitely not that, aha! Here they are, the core crystals, the single edition that makes these dang things worth opening. Now, you may have heard some people call Xenoblade 2 a gotcha game, which is somewhat true. I wouldn't call it a gotcha game per se, just an RPG with gotcha mechanics. These core crystals are this game's version of gotcha currency. Now, I know what you might be thinking, but I promise you, it's not some scummy microtransaction thing that locks content behind a paywall. This game has no microtransactions, and aside from an expansion pass focused around story DLC, there are no in-app purchases. What this game does is that it turns a model traditionally used in free-to-play or mobile games and works it seamlessly into a full-size RPG. And this was like three years before Genshin Impact. Now, I know this mechanic isn't for everyone, some might find it restricting or limiting, but I think this random way of summoning party members personalizes each player's experience to an extent. If you and a friend play through this game together, you will definitely end up with different blades and you could compare your rosters. This creates fun ways to talk about the game, which is always appreciated. Even if the gotcha thing isn't for you, you have to admit, there's nothing more exhilarating than pulling a character you really wanted after trying for a while. No one can resist that feeling. Summoning a new blade is like opening a goodie bag. You get a super cool cutscene when summoning them from their core crystal, you get to see the unique art that represents that blade in the menus, and you get a new set of field and battle skills to check out. That's all without mentioning their design and character. The character designers at Monolith did a great job with these designs. I don't want to show too many because I feel like seeing them for the first time is half the fun. Not all the designs are winners, people who have played the game before know what I'm talking about, but around 80% of them are incredible. And then there's the character part of these characters. Each blade gets their personality fleshed out through a story quest exclusive to them, complete with some animated cutscenes and voice acting throughout. As much as I might have made it sound as if blades are only used for exploration, they are also the main way of customizing your character in battle. Think of blades as your traditional equipable weapons in RPGs, which I suppose makes sense considering the name. One advantage blades have over traditional RPG weapons is that every blade you get will always be viable in some way. There won't be a blade that you get that becomes worthless as enemies get higher levels. Blades are also not exclusive to any one party member, so you can fully customize each character with any weapon type you want, aside from each character's first blade that is exclusive to them. This is a very good thing for any RPG battle system to have. Not only does it contribute to the game's sense of personalization that I mentioned earlier, it also gives players the freedom to create a team that suits their playstyle for each character. Speaking of the battle system... I truly believe a battle system can make or break an RPG. Usually the battle phase is what you spend most of the time doing in one of these games. And if you dislike battling, that's a lot of battles you're going to have to slog through to finish the game. Now, the combat in Xenoblade 2 is one of the most polarizing aspects of the game. The main complaint you'll hear from anyone who got partially into Xenoblade 2, but never finished it, is that the battle system is slow, boring, uneventful, and consists of just waiting around. These people aren't wrong. The battle system for the first hour consists of a lot of waiting around and pressing a button every 5 seconds to trigger one of your arts. This can turn a lot of people off, because... Yes, it is boring, but this game opts to take the slow approach when it comes to adding elements to the combat system. But I can promise you, the combat system is anything but boring when it comes to the end of the game. I would compare Xenoblade 2's combat system to juggling. It has a circular nature, and your attention has to be in multiple different places at any one time. When battles are going well, there should always be something new to do, whether it's a new art, a new blade to switch to, or a special from another party member that you can trigger. This is in such stark contrast to the beginning of the game that struggles from too much downtime in battles. Battles consist of building blocks that gradually do more damage. Auto attacks to arts, arts to specials, specials to orbs, and orbs to a chain attack. Look at this screenshot that depicts the battle system at its busiest. Every little box and meter represents something different to use or pay attention to. It might look like a lot, and some might find it overkill, but just remember this if you are ever struggling with the basicness of early game battles. There's an aspect of this battle system that can get strangely rhythmic at times. You get attack bonuses if you time your attacks just right, and certain unlockable skills give you the ability to do this multiple times in a row. 
What this ends up creating is a kind of chain reaction where all of your attacks flow into each other through proper timing, and it feels like every action you take follows this imaginary rhythm. You definitely won't experience this right away, but when everything clicks, it can be very satisfying. Now, I think this battle system is genius, and it would be enough for me to call this game genius on its own, but I'm aware that some people might never click with this battle system, and that can be off-putting to some players. Even so, I still don't think the battle system is the most genius part of Xenoblade 2's gameplay. That's because that honor belongs to what I like to call the gameplay loop. Now, what do I mean by the gameplay loop? What I mean is the way that the individual tasks you can do in the game all complement each other and serve a greater purpose. And let me tell you, there's a lot to do in this game. I'm going to list out every little system and objective that the game has to offer. It's going to be pretty overwhelming, but I'll break it down in a second. There are regular side quests, blade quests, collectible blades, blade affinity charts, blade trust, upgradable arts, skill trees, character experience, unique monsters, hearts to hearts, and merc missions. Sounds like a lot to do, right? And yes, that is a lot to do. But these pieces all come together to form a literal loop that is the foundation of all the gameplay of this game. Let's just say you've reached a point in the game with a tough boss fight that you just can't beat and you want to make your party stronger. Well, there's many different ways to do this. First, you could send your blades out on merc missions, which are little quests that are done automatically. You choose a few of your blades to send out, and after a timer of varying length finishes, they will come back with all sorts of goodies, like money or new items. Also, blades you send out will return with many of their stats increased, including new skills that change how they act in battle. These skills all have individual actions that can be done to unlock them, like collecting items or dealing enough damage in battle, but these merc missions can unlock these without any direct action from the player, saving you a lot of work, especially if you want to maximize a blade's power. If you do end up obtaining all of a blade's skills, you get items that give you weapon points, which can make your main character's arts a lot stronger as well. The idea of timed quests that are done automatically is a simple addition to the game's mechanics, but a much appreciated one meaning you can do more stuff in less time. There are, of course, your regular side quests, which reward EXP and make your blade stronger, but I tended to find these parts a bit dull at points. Nevertheless, they are a great way to level up your characters and blades quickly. You also have the blade quests that I mentioned, which are much more engaging due to the fact that it gives you an opportunity to learn more about the characters that make up your party. They give equally good, if not better, rewards than regular side quests, so I would always prioritize those. In my opinion, the best way of getting stronger is by defeating unique monsters. Returning from Xenoblade 1, the unique monsters are a very clever mechanic. Monsters that only occur once in the world and are often way stronger than other monsters in the area. It always gives you a new challenge when backtracking through an old area to collect materials or complete a side quest. Defeating these powerful monsters is definitely worth your while, as they give large amounts of EXP, weapon points, skill tree points, blade trust, and some specific skills for blades that are exclusive to defeating that unique monster. Best of all, unique monsters drop more core crystals, meaning that they are your most effective way of getting another shot at a new blade that could be your key to victory. So that's all of what Xenoblade 2's side content boils down to. Merc missions, side quests, and unique monsters. Through these three methods, you can get a lot stronger, a lot faster, and see almost everything the game has to offer. I also feel like all of this eliminates the need for traditional enemy grinding. I never once found myself resorting to grinding. I always felt like there was something new to do in the world. I know that was a lot to take in, and if you came to this video without having touched this game, you're probably feeling overwhelmed. But all I'm going to say is that if anything in this video, or even outside of this video, has interested you in this game, give it a shot. Any fan of this game will tell you it is 100% worth it, and while it definitely isn't for everyone, it's at least worth a shot. Also, this game is worth the $60 price alone just to hear the soundtrack. Seriously, the music in this game is godlike. If I may offer one more piece of advice for those of you looking to try this game, use the tools at your disposal. This game is a tutorial problem, in the sense that it does a bad job at teaching you the things you need to know, and doesn't let you review the things you've already learned. Use the internet when you get confused about something, and please don't be afraid to look up where to find collectibles. I'm also going to link this video by Chugga Conroy in the description, which does an incredible job at explaining some of the more confusing aspects of this game. He also explains things like 10 times better than I did, so there's that as well. And with that, I believe that that's all I have to say about the gameplay of this game. If you stuck it out to the end, thank you so much for watching this video. Whether you're a Xenoblade fan or not, I hope something I said here resonated with you. Happy gaming, everyone.